Unless you're hiding under a rock, you know that the exotic car market has taken off over the past two years. Today's video topic is gonna be completely about the top 10 most undervalued supercars. Now it feels like just yesterday, but three years ago, we published a video of the top 10 most undervalued supercars. And a lot has changed in that time. We had COVID, we had bring a trailer explode. We had all these different factors that culminated in today's market. And I would say the most interesting part is I definitely had some massive winners, not to toot my own horn. And I had some all, all other cars that just sort of plateaued. And, and really what I'd like to do is sort of reset our thinking and also talk about the future. Now, I'm not gonna go into 10 cars today. I'm actually gonna go into nine cars. We'll go back into the old video and talk a little bit about some of my predictions then. And then for car number 10, I want the love from our fans and friends from around the world. Write your comments, write your opinions in the comments section, fill it up and tell us what you think. Biggest, biggest, I would say, winner from our original video would have to be the Bugatti EB110. At this time, uh, when we first published these videos, these cars were struggling anywhere between 800,000, 900,000, and probably right around a million dollars. And this market has completely changed. These cars sell today anywhere from two to three million dollars. And it really makes sense. I mean, if you think about history and where Bugatti is as a brand today, this is the car that inspired the entire future uh, of the company. Now, the original Bugatti EB110, as we know, the company went into bankruptcy, insolvency, and that company basically was purchased, or the remnants were purchased by Dower, and then the brand, et cetera, was purchased by Volkswagen Audi Group, who would later produce the Veyron and the Chiron. But the EB110, I still think, is a very, very special car, one of less than 130 cars ever produced, the GT and the SS cars. So definitely still a special car, but not as undervalued. Now, the one car that I think is still incredibly, incredibly undervalued, and this is going to be car number one, is the Lamborghini Diablo Special Variants. And I think really my opinion is cars like the SE30 and cars like the GT that are just so, so rare, one of 150 or one of 80, they are still undervalued. These cars range anywhere between 600,000 and as much as 1.2 million today. But when you compare them to an F40, uh, which is really the comparable of the SE30, and when you compare them to the F50, which is the comparable of the GT in my opinion, these cars are just pure cheap. Uh, the production numbers don't lie. The, the fit and finish doesn't lie. And their place in history. So I think the Lamborghini Diablo special edition cars, whether an SV, a rare roadster, an SE30, a GT, especially a Yoda, are probably the most undervalued modern supercars today. In our original video, I talked about the Ferrari 512TR and 512M, and, and I have to say these cars have done very, very well in the past three years. U.S. examples today sell between 300,000 and 400,000, uh, as much as 500,000 for really low mileage, really excellent 512TRs, and 512Ms have taken off. I mean, we're talking five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars for really nice cars. But if we're talking about more modern Ferraris, I think the Ferrari 550 Barchetta is still completely underlooked. You know, three, four years ago, they were anywhere between 300,000 and 400,000. And I think you could still find really nice cars today between 400,000 and 500,000. Really special cars will demand 600, 650,000. These cars are numbered one of 448 manual transmission, V12, open roof. They just don't get much better than this. And they're just so fun to drive. Um, you know, they're timing belt driven. So you have to do the timing belts every five to seven years, whatever the intervals are, but you don't actually have to pull the engine and they can be very reliable. They've got a ton of torque. They're easy to drive. They're fun. They're fast. Uh, the AC works great. They do everything amazing. The only issue is their top but whatever, you're not gonna take this car out on a rainy day. I think the 550 Barchetta is one of the most undervalued supercars today. 
Now, when I originally launched this video, I spoke so highly of the Carrera GT, and I still am a massive fan of the Carrera GT, but the values of Carrera GTs have completely exploded. I used to buy these cars between 600 and 800,000. Today, 800,000 won't even buy you the worst example in the world, a salvage title 30,000 mile car, I think is still probably $900,000 today. These cars at one point reached uh, almost $2 million for a few paint to sample cars that traded. But I think today these cars range anywhere between 1.3 million and 1.7, $1.8 million. These cars are basically one of the best supercars ever built, probably one of the best Porsches ever built. They did build a lot, um, but I think the future in these cars and, and appreciation has to be in the unique colored cars. Uh, very few cars were produced in basalt black, black, yellow, red, and then the paint to sample colors. Um, and then we can't forget seal gray, but these cars are still really great. This is not gonna go on my most undervalued list. If we're talking about sort of hypercars and supercars of a modern generation, I have to say that the Bugatti Veyron is still incredibly undervalued. This car was on my original list, um, and these cars really haven't moved much, and it's sort of shocking to see. I mean, when the Bugatti Veyron was first launched, Volkswagen Audi Group basically lost a lot of money on each car. There was so much research and development to break all the speed records to make it still a usable, practical car, and they really changed the world. I mean, in many ways, the Bugatti Veyron is the first hypercar um, of all the hypercars, and you think of sort of the impact it had on automotive history, I think of Bugatti Veyron is still incredibly undervalued. Now, through COVID and through this sort of generational shift, and I've talked about this in videos before. I mean, we see it. The cars of the 80s and 90s have exploded. The next generation of supercars have exploded. Usable cars have exploded. And I still think, you know, the cars from the 50s and 60s, certain icons will forever hold their place in the automotive world. Um, but I think those cars have fully appreciated. There's a few cars that I will say make a huge exception. One of those is the Lamborghini Miura SV. Now, when you think of Lamborghini and you think of Lamborghini as a brand, you have to say that the Miura SV is probably the most important Lamborghini ever produced. It's the car that sort of changed the world. The SV is the best variant of the Miura. It's the widest, it has the different suspension. Uh, it's, it just looks, it has this incredible stance. You can still park a Miura SV with its wide hips and wide wheels next to a Ferrari F40 or any modern supercar and it looks still great today. It's considered one of the most beautiful cars in the world and they're very, very rare. You're talking about one of 150 produced for the world. And when you think of extremely rare Ferraris or you think of these special Ferraris that are so iconic, like a 250 GTO, there are so many, so many Ferraris that are worth more than $10 million, worth more than $20 million. And when you think of Lamborghini, there's just really no cars that have brought those premiums yet. I think the world is changing and Lamborghini is becoming a truly appreciated and a recognized brand to major connoisseurs, major collectors. And I think the ultimate Lamborghini ever produced, the Miura SV is still undervalued. The fact that these cars are still selling between three and $4 million makes zero sense when you compare them to the cars from Ferrari and the important cars. What's wild in COVID, we saw the prices of P400 Miuras and P400 S Miuras almost double cars that were selling between a million and, and let's say a million five. We're selling now today between 1.8 and $2.1 million. So those cars have appreciated and the Miura SV has not yet. And I just think they are so special, they're so incredible, and they are still undervalued today. There is no hiding that I'm a huge fan of AMG pre-merger cars, and we've seen some incredible results of some AMG hammers that have sold publicly for $700,000 plus, but the reality is they're still so many incredible AMG cars that were produced in the 1980s and early 1990s. And, and really, I think all of these cars, any of the V8 cars, the 5.4 liter, 5.6 liter, six liter cars are just so undervalued. Do you look at what sort of Roof has done and sort of the marketing that Roof has done and, and the collectors 
that have chased these roof cars. I mean, I don't think there is a roof car ex that exists today less than 600,000, 500,000. And there's many cars that are trading as much as $2 million. And when you look at roof as a brand and you look at AMG as a brand, they sort of started in the same way. They made huge, huge sort of shifts to the automotive community. They were on the cover of all the magazines. There's a generation of collectors and enthusiasts that were inspired by the cover of Broad and Track uh, in 1987. And I think these cars are just still so undervalued. They're still fast today. They're usable. They're very reliable. And I think with all of the AMG produced today, I mean, we're talking tens of thousands of cars that are mass produced. These cars have a huge generation of future collectors that would love to own these cars one day. So I think any of the SEC six liters, the, the SL60 six liter cars, they are just too cheap the way they sit. Now, I am not an American car expert by any means, but there are two American cars that I completely love. And, and again, I, I'm, I have to start, one is a very specific model and it's the Dodge Viper GTSR. Now, when you think of sort of, you know, history and looking back and sort of the influence of video games, I'll never forget playing Gran Turismo as a young guy and, and I couldn't wait to sort of obtain the Viper GTSR, the white with blue stripes. And I think that car, when you think of history and when you think and look back, I mean, this was a car that was built to celebrate uh, the Viper's incredible wins, not just at the 24 hour Le Mans, uh, but really the Viper dominated in its class around the world. Uh, a one of a hundred produced to celebrate their racing, uh, sort of a homologation type car. And then when you look at the way Dodge produced these cars and they delivered them to VIPs, they had this incredible experience. You got a, uh, a disposable camera that actually took pictures of the production and the progress of your car. And then I guess the la you got the camera and then the last photo was actually supposed to be you taking delivery of the car. They came with a, a, a hand-signed watercolor. They came with all these really cool features. So I really look at these as true VIP cars of that period. You know, we had bought and sold a few that were around 100 to 110,000. And today, I think a, a car just traded this week for about $190,000. A thousand mile car, a 2,000 mile car. When you think of sort of the pricing of cars and the iconic nature of that V10, the Dodge Viper that changed, uh, I would say, you know, supercar world for the, for, for the American market, I think the GTSR is incredibly undervalued. <laughs> Another car I love is another tuning car. And, and if you look at sort of what I look at today, I, I look at this generation of tuning cars uh, as really the coach builders of our time. And, and what I loved about these, you know, sort of wacky tuning cars like Koenig and, and Roof and all these different cars and Gambala as well is, and this is so special, is that they really captured people's hearts. I mean, I can't tell you how many people tell me they saw a Gambala on the cover of a magazine and, and they'll never forget it as a kid. Um, and that's going to bring up another car. I think what Callaway did in the racing world and what they did for Corvettes is just so special. When you start to think about special Callaway cars, they're very, very limited. Again, I don't know much about these cars, but I've chased a few around 100 to 150,000. I think one day we're gonna look back at Callaway, we're gonna look back at these really special Corvettes, and we're gonna say, wow, those cars were just too cheap. Now, not to brag or, or, or gloat, but we did talk about the Porsche 959 in our previous video. And if you look at the 959, they've just done incredibly well. Uh, I think when we purchased our first example, it was around 900,000. I think the same car today could sell for like 1.6 to 1.8. So, so they've almost doubled. And there's one car that I talked about in the original video, that I've talked about a lot, and these cars have still sort of seemed, I, I believe they sort of still struggled, and that's a 348 Challenge and 355 Challenge. Now, what's so shocking to me is 355 examples have done incredibly well. You'd have a GTS, uh, you know, a nice GTS, which they made a few thousand of, 
Uh, a manual example sells today anywhere between 250 and 300,000, depending upon condition. Uh, it has to be located in the US, I will say that. I think they're probably a little bit less in Europe. Uh, 348 challenges, again, they've sort of struggled. 348s have done a little bit better. Um, but when you compare these numbers to what a 348 or 355 challenge are, uh, I think there's less than 40 348 challenge produced uh, for the world, less than 110 355 challenge produced for the world. And these are road cars that were converted to race cars at the factory or at the dealer. These are cars that essentially could be used on the road again, road registered again. And these are factory Ferrari race cars. So, you know, you think of history. I mean, these are the last manual race cars produced by Ferrari. I could go on and on and all about all of the details, but these are some of the most undervalued supercars, I believe, today. I am a huge fan of the Koenigsegg brand. Now, I will say I have to, uh, I was a bit enamored and, and sort of, I had this incredible opportunity to go on the road uh, with a dear client. Uh, we joined a Koenigsegg rally uh, that was led by Mr. Koenigsegg himself. And, and I was sort of really blown away by his humility and, and, and sort of everyone involved with the brand, their passion. And, you know, when talking to everyone, I realized just how similar Koenigsegg is to Lamborghini in the early days. We're talking hand-built cars, uh, you know, a, a group of young engineers that were always pushing uh, sort of the boundaries of technology and design. And really, you think of the same customer uh, that, that believed in Koenigsegg in the early days, uh, that wanted to make a statement. Uh, it's the same customer of the early days of Lamborghini. So I look at the brand so similar, and, and you, as you guys obviously know, Lamborghini holds a special place in my heart, and I am starting to fall in love with the historic Koenigsegg cars. And I think they're just so interesting, they're so rare. This early generation of manual Koenigsegg cars, when you compare them to the early cars from Pagani, that are selling for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars. All of the Koenigsegg cars that have historically sold at auction have sold between 800,000, 1.3 million. Um, and yes, it's still a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money when you think of their important part of history and where Koenigsegg today is as a brand. And they really have changed the world. They're constantly pushing the boundaries. Of, of, of almost everything, um, you know, uh, he rethinks the way uh, the automotive world works and, and sort of the technology, which is incredibly, uh, incredibly unique. Um, so I really have to say that I think the early CCX, uh, CCS, uh, I'm sorry, CC8, uh, CCR, CCX, CCXR, those cars are incredibly undervalued and they have to sort of round out our list. Now these are in no particular order. I'd probably personally throw the Diablos up top somewhere just, <laughs> just because I love Diablos. That being said, I want your opinion. I want your input. I wanna hear from you guys. I would love to see what you guys think. Don't forget to write uh, you know, sort of your thoughts. You can write a paragraph. You can write 10 cars, I don't care. But for card number 10, I wanna hear from you. So I, I, I'm super excited to see the comments. Thank you guys again for watching. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to subscribe. We have a ton more incredible vintage supercar content coming.